This episode of our podcast is brought to you by Doolaban Insurance. If you live in Ontario, Canada, and are looking for the best price and coverage for your Tesla, give Doolaban a call at 1 855 385 4226 or visit their website at doolabaninsurance.com slash Tesla. Hey everyone, welcome again to another edition of the Tesla Owners Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Page, and I'm joined by my good friends, Ian Pavelko and Eric Camacho. Ga- guys, how are you doing? Good evening, everyone. Doing well, doing well, you guys. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining in, as usual. Um, I think before we begin, we just have to put out uh, the fact that uh, while we really enjoy uh, listener, viewers, and questions, and uh, we like to do that, uh, tonight we're going to be talking mostly well, pretty much all, <laughs> about the uh, recent Tesla shareholder meeting. So we've decided tonight to uh, forego answering questions. That's why we didn't ask for any um, this week. We will reprise next week because we have lots to cover. Um, also, just to apologize in advance, uh, Beverly is working down here with me, and she's got laryngitis. So if she starts coughing, you'll know where it came from. It's not the cat. It's my wife. So wish her well. <laughs> well, uh, how have you guys been? What have you been up to lately? Anything going on? It's been work. a very busy week. Work. Oh. Work. Work. And work. Work. More. More. <laughs> more work. <laughs> it has been pouring cats and dogs today. Um, I don't I know how much relate. rain we got. And I mean, it's sunny outside now, but man alive, I've never seen so much rain. And I think the whole eastern seaboard we're, is we're covered gonna, in rain right now. Yeah, we're going to get uh, dumped on for the next four days, apparently. <sighs> Oh, that's horrible because I got a car show to go to on Sunday and I don't want to be rained out. Oh, by the way, we're also going to a concert tomorrow night. And uh, part of it is outside, so I'm not looking forward to getting rained out. Well, enough of that. Let's jump in because, uh, of course, uh, you know, the big news this week is Tesla had their shareholder meeting at the uh, Computer History Museum in, uh, I think, what is it, Mountain View? I forget. I was there a couple years ago. Great place. I only got to spend a couple hours there. It's definitely something, if you ever get a chance to go and check it out, uh, when I get back down there, I'm going to spend some more time because they literally have all kinds of stuff in there that's uh, of real interest. But uh, this is traditionally where Tesla holds their shareholder meeting. And uh, Elon got on stage after the boring stuff they talk about, about uh, you know voting and all that other stuff. All we want to hear is what Elon has to say. And sometimes these events are always the best place to get some uh, little juicy tidbits about what Tesla is working on, and we certainly got our share of it. So um, I'm going to bring up some screen snapshots here because I'm not going to show you the video. I will put the link to the uh, shareholder meeting um, if you haven't watched it in the uh, video description or the podcast, so you can check it out on your own time. But I will bring up some, uh, some, some screenshots here. So the first thing that Elon got up on stage and talked about, and uh, let's see here. Well, Model 3 is outselling all of their competitors combined. This is no surprise. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk on the internet. Oh, there's no demand for the Model 3. All the Tesla shorties have certainly got their panties in a knot, but it's not true. Uh, <laughs> the car is doing exceptionally well. Uh, of course, they just started uh, delivering cars over in Europe, and very soon they will start making their way over to Australia and the Asian markets, of course, for all the right-hand drive stuff. So as they open up into new markets, this car is just going to uh, to take over. So they're doing very well on the uh, on the demand side of things. Uh, what they really suffer from, of course, as usual, <laughs> is uh, supply. They can't make enough cars. Uh, again, they will. We'll talk more about some of that stuff later on because there's some juicy tidbits as far as that's concerned. Speaking of the demand, while you're mentioning that, sixty-three mm-hmm. percent uh, of the vehicles that were traded in on their orders were not premium vehicles, yeah. and ninety percent of all new orders were from non-reservation holders. So, so it, demand problem, my ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, that, Phil that Schiller, for that one. That's yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Model 3 is also the highest revenue car in its class. And I just have to fast forward here to the right slide. Here we go. Boom. There's the slide. Boom. Yeah, boom. So Tesla's doing really well on that front. Uh, highest car by uh, highest. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Best selling car by revenue. So the next one down is the Toyo Camry, the Honda Accord, Honda Civic, Honda. So lots of Honda, lots of Toyota in there. Mm-hmm. It's interesting though that they're comparing against most of these cars, whereas the real target market for the Model Three 
is, uh, you know, the the C-Class, the A4s, the BMW 3 Series in terms of what they're gearing towards. But Mm -hmm. it's interesting that they're putting it up against these other cars. So maybe these are, you think these are higher margin cars uh, than the BMWs and Mercedes? It can't be. Mm, I mean, those are premium cars. No. Go ahead, Ian. I was going to say, highly unlikely that they are, but there's this is like the weirdest phenomenon we've ever seen in passenger car sales in like forever. Because what's happening is exactly what Eric just referred to that that 63% of people who are coming up from, you know, standard or economy cars, you know, doing as we what we call the Tesla stretch and and going up into a much higher bracket car um, is is playing havoc with it. Because these are people who in the absence of a Model 3, I presume, would have bought a new Civic or a new Camry or a Corolla or something like that. So, yeah, it's completely upending the sales statistics for that reason. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing that's important here, because this was a shareholders meeting, it's important that they're showing this uh, this particular slide for revenue. The Model 3 was not uh, based on numbers, the highest selling car in terms of total number of cars sold. In units, but- correct. Right, in units. I think it came in third or fourth, uh, if I recall correctly. Uh, but in terms of revenue, it's, the high, it's actually number one. And that's yeah. important, again, because it is a shareholders meeting. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. Um, and then some of the juicy stuff really started to come out. Um, Elon got up. <laughs> now, he, he, um, he had a slide up here, and he was uh, comparing, of course, the new Model S, of course, gets 370 miles of range. Mm-hmm. And um, he did let slip out of the bag. And if you listen very carefully, Elon said that uh, it won't be long before we see a 400-mile range car. This is the slide uh, that they put up there saying, you know, unmatched since 2012. I mean, Tesla still has the longest range um, EVs of any of them on the market. And at the same time, in the same breath, he said that uh, it won't be long before we see a 400-mile car. Now, um Scuttlebutt going around, of course, that eventually Tesla is working on a uh, on an upgraded battery pack. Don't know when that's going. Um, I'm kind of loath to discuss that possibility, um, given that it is uh, an end of a quarter, and of course we don't know what things are going on. Again, you know, you never know what's going on behind mm-hmm. uh, closed doors and stuff like that. But it, look, it, it you don't it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that Tesla's not sitting on their laurels. They're, they're always working on something, and next year there'll be a better car, and the year after that there'll be a better car. But uh, 400 miles, I mean, what's that, 640 kilometers, something like that? I mean, that's pretty game-changing. I mean, as... if, you're already, if you're already putting out roughly 370 in the uh, the 100D Model S, uh, which, again, they've renamed it, it seems like 10 times over now, uh, <laughs> is is that if you, if you do have the battery pack of the Model 3 and you scale it up to the size of the Model S and you adjust the chassis undercarriage a bit so that it fits uh, in the molding, then all of a sudden, it's not hard to believe that you could do actually put out a 400 mile range car, if not then some. Um, mm-hmm. We've already seen with software updates for Model 3 owners like us that the range of the car, if charged to 100%, is even higher. Even now, when I charge my car to 90% daily, I used to get you know, roughly 270. I'm now getting about 282 uh, at 90%. And that's with the, nothing's changed. It's just the software of the car. So it's. It, it is conceivable both in terms of upgraded batteries, which we'll get into greater detail with the production with Maxwell, what that might look like. Uh, but if you consider they're going to put out new batteries and you have the option of enlarging the pack with a denser battery, it's not inconceivable. They can actually do that by end of the year uh, and all of a sudden put out a 400 mile range car. Not that difficult. Well, we also know that the Roadster is going to be 200, uh, oh, yeah. 200 kilowatt hour battery pack and that'll mm-hmm. do you know 600 and some odd miles on, mm-hmm. a, on a charge. Again, that's a very thick battery pack, um, sure. you know, so uh, it's, uh, that's a different animal altogether, <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, but to get, but the crank out that, I mean, we're talking less than 10% increase if you're looking from 370 to 400, that's, that doesn't seem to be like that's a, a hard thing to accomplish. Now, if they were to say 420, 440, 450, then we're talking, well, like, what are you, what are you really reaching for there? But to go from 370 to 400? Yeah, that's that's an attainable goal, I think, in the next six months. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, especially with myself, you know, I'm I'm used to my car. It's not as efficient as a Model Three. It's mm-hmm. bigger. It's heavier. Doesn't get the same range and stuff. But in my mind, for the type of driving that I do, and I think for most people, range anxiety is very much a psychological thing. It's not yeah. a reality type thing. Um, and once you get to two hundred sixty-five, three hundred miles and stuff, I mean, that's more than enough than anybody really needs. Yeah, it's nice to have yeah. a little bit more. 
if you live in a colder climate, because, you know, mm-hmm. range loss in the winter months is definitely a, a thing. Um, but, you know, if I get a car that has a thousand kilometers on range, I mean, like, I, I would never use that. <laughs> I would I mean, definitely I mean, on a road trip and stuff. I mean, my bladder would give out more than the battery would, right? Yeah. So, no, that's, that's cannonball run type stuff, essentially, yeah, at that point. Exactly. The Alex Roy's of this world will certainly yes. take advantage of that, but Absolutely. not us. <laughs> All right. Um, Elon did talk a little bit about Model Y. It is still on track for uh, a fall 2020 uh, production start. Again, I think we have to caution everyone. Uh, what we saw with the Model 3 was, you know, first handoff of a few cars. I know somebody on Twitter um, said that there's a possibility they may do something in June, first handoffs or something like that. But volume production, I really don't think personally, volume production is really going to hit until Q1 of 2021. And the reason I say that is, and we've talked about this on the show many times before, that even though Tesla wants to take what they've learned from Model 3 and get this production going as fast as possible, you know, at the last um, earnings call, he did talk about some radical change that they're going to make as far as reducing the number of body panels on the base part of the car. They're going to a casting. Uh, that is going to take some time to ramp up. So, yes, you can el- eliminate some robots and so on and so forth, but depending on what kind of machinery that they develop to do this process, th- there's a possibility they could run in some snags. So of course, Elon is is Elon, and he's he is optimistic in a lot of his ways. He'd even said so during the... Uh, uh, during the shareholder meeting, but I think we have to be cautious about that. Uh, personally, I think volume for, uh, like I said, Model Y is really a 2021, early 2021 type of thing. So mm-hmm. they might be able to get a few thousand out. This is not our first rodeo. We've seen this happen before. So even though they're going to reuse a lot of parts, maybe reuse some of the production techniques and stuff, but they're, they're, they're not leaving well enough alone. They're still changing some stuff as far as the production is concerned. So just want to put that out there just in the, on the off chance that, uh, you know, you think you're going to get your car in the fall of 2020 if you order now. May or may not happen. But some other stuff did come out. Uh, of course, he reiterated, uh, the reiterated um, that he they think that it's a, a two and a half larger, bigger segment than the Model 3, which I mm-hmm. tend to believe. Um, yeah. I mean, North America, we're crazy about... Sp- SUVs in general, or small CUVs, if you will, because that's right. really what this is. I hate to use SUV; it's not an SUV. Um, it's a Cross, it's a, a crossover. crossover. It's a crossover, yeah. exactly. Right. So yeah, they're they're calling for two and a half uh, times segment, which would not surprise me in the least. I would say probably two, but yeah, it could be two to three times larger than Model Three. Again, three hundred mile range, fall twenty twenty production, as they said. But the other thing that they did say was uh, they're hoping and they think they may be able to get the uh, the CDA, which is the uh, co- uh, coefficient drag um, of the Model Y, possibly lower than the Model 3. Now, that's typically hard to do on an SUV when you go tall because when you do that, of course, oh, you're including right. your frontal area. Uh, so Well, let's, actually, I just want to correct you on the terminology, um, Trev, because CDA is the total. In other words, that's your total okay. drag figure because your coefficient of drag times the area. So it's what I... CD. Yeah, exactly. Just CD. And I'm pretty sure that's what Elon was talking about. And I don't actually find it shocking that they could potentially get a better uh, CD out of the Y. Because if you look at like, you know, prototype vehicles over the years that get insane CDs, you know, like Volkswagen had their, what was it, the X1 or whatever that little tiny vehicle was that they had. I know what you're talking about. The name escapes me. Same here. But it had like, you know, a crazy low CD, like 0.17 or something of that nature. And cars historically with these super low drag figures basically all had a teardrop shape, right? or something between an egg and a teardrop. So I think as you round out the roof line and you make it more egg-like, there's maybe the potential to, to, to optimize a little bit. Um, make, making this particular vehicle taller and having that super sloping gentle back, I don't know, I'm not an aerodynamicist, take all this with a huge <laughs> grain of salt, but I'm picturing that there might be some magical way, you know, and not to mention that, you know, they, they've had the design now for a couple of years uh, of the Model 3, so maybe, starting out with that as a baseline and, and tweaking and tweaking and tweaking. So I've no doubt that they could potentially get the CD down. The CDA, the total drag, because it is a taller face, that would be interesting. But even if they achieve the same range number, because at high speed anyway, it, that's it's all going to be about drag, uh, that tells us that the drag figures are very close. If it's, you know, 325 for the three and actually we should compare dual motor to dual motor, right? Because there's so far, I haven't heard any word that there's going to be a rear-wheel drive only 
why? Do we think that's going to be? Have we talked about? I, I wouldn't think there would be. No, I mean, I, I all along I've been assuming they're going to follow the Model X pattern, whereas the, the where the Y will be, you know, um, all wheel drive only. A dual motor only right. um so then we'd have to compare it to a dual motor threes and which is you know 310 miles so mm -hmm. i don't know I'm, I'm not an aerodynamicist myself either but i have done a you little don't bit say. of I, I have looked into it a little bit but i play one on tv yes yes but i stayed at a holiday inn express um <laughs> there we go. um my understanding is that cars with the cutoff back like Tesla tends to do actually get better aerodynamics than most sedans do. I, it has to do with the, the, the airflow in the back. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the reasons why Tesla does those teardrop type roofs where they're all one piece mm -hmm. rather than, you know, cutting back and, and doing, you know, the typical bubble sedan type of thing. Um, I like the look personally, but um, anyways, we'll remain to be seen. Um, it was interesting because, uh, Ian, you probably remember when we were at the Model Y event, they had that black aerodynamic buck sitting yeah. outside yeah, uh, with all the little tassels on it and stuff. And they had one of their aerodynamicists and stuff. And I talked to him and he says, well, I, I used to do aerodynamics for an F1 team. Yes. So they know where, where to hire the right people. So it was interesting to see. That was the first time I've ever seen anything like that. Actually, you know what, you know what I'm thinking about when I'm hearing all of this conversation and, and recapping the video is... I think similar to the Model 3, the prototypes we saw that were displayed on stage a few years ago uh, ended up not being the final versions that we saw. So if they're trying to get the coefficient down, it's entirely plausible the uh, prototype that you two saw in person in California several weeks ago could be not even close to the final version in terms of its overall shape. I mean, I think the overall look will be the same thing, but if they're if they're gonna if they're thinking they can get the coefficient drag even lower then the one they've used and tested is probably not what the final version will be, which means there might still be some changes here and there, uh, subtle curve differences, or the roof might slope a bit differently, or whatever it might be. But uh, it, it could be like the three, where there's a difference between the prototypes that were showcased at the reveal event versus what the final production vehicle will be. There, there's always room for improvement, little mm -hmm. s tweaks and so on and so forth. But yeah. Um, again, we have to be cautious about that uh, because, you know, they can't be making changes three months before they go into production. Of a lot of this stuff has to be locked down a year before. Mm -hmm. So, in, and in Tesla fashion, they don't show concepts. What they show are production intent prototypes. Mm -hmm. um, I do believe that there's probably maybe a little bit of tweaking they can do here and there and stuff like that. But I don't think there's anything, as far as what we've seen on the Model Y, um, I mean, I saw the, uh, the Model 3 alpha prototype and i mean unless you had a production car in that car beside you know side by side other mm -hmm. than some really small minor things the shape never changed the car i mean the car was cemented that's what they shipped so my personal opinion here what we see in the model y is essentially what they want to put into production minus some small little tweaks just for manufacturing efficiencies mm -hmm. and so on and so forth um again um, model y is the first car they've shown well actually the model, model 3 had mirrors on it um yeah but you can tell they don't like mirrors and they would love to get rid of them because every little bit helps, right? But um, anyway. Regulatory so, approval. Yeah, they won't let them do it. So, yeah, if you ever see a Tesla without mirrors, it's like, yeah, don't be counting your chickens because that's not happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the other thing I found interesting, of course, and I unfortunately I don't have the pictures here, but I do have some excellent photos that uh, my friend Caleb Elston, who uh, does the podcast, The uh, Tesla Show, along with his friend uh, Mike Demers, uh, he was at the uh, shareholder meeting and he sent me some wonderful photos. I'll put them in here and post and you guys can take a look at them. Um, they look phenomenal. And it was interesting that they actually had a red Model Y there. Mm -hmm. And since I wasn't there, I don't know if it was drivable or not. Um, I don't think anybody saw it drive. I think all the cars they had on the show were red. Uh, I, yes. I, I, yeah, well, it had the, road hardware, right? the, the, the Roadster was red. The Model uh -huh. Y was red. Yeah. The semi truck is the old black one. It's been wrapped. Yeah, <laughs> it has a it has a vinyl wrap on it. Uh, but, but yes, the red is nice. It shows well. Yeah, just I there was a lot of CSIing over the um, the brakes on that, so it, it definitely had performance brakes on it. Yes, yes, one hundred percent. And you could even see there was full suspension underneath because we were all going tinfoil hat over whether it had different knuckles and stuff on Twitter. Uh, between yesterday and today, so um, I, I got to think that it's a running prototype. Being a crossover, there are bound to be changes in the geometry, I think, for the suspension. 
but it wouldn't surprise me in the least that, I mean, yes, that one had performance breaks. That's patently obvious. I mean, I caught it just as well as you did uh, because someone on Twitter yeah. said, oh, what's going on with the what's going on with the rotors? I said, those are performance rotors. If you've never seen one before, those pulled right off a of Model 3. So uh, there's no doubt that that's what's going on there. So anyways, uh, interesting to see that they have at least what appears to be another drivable prototype. It doesn't look like it was wrapped. Could have been the blue one. Who knows? Um, nice to see the roads through there. Again, mm-hmm. no yeah. talk about the roadster whatsoever, which I find frustrating. But that's that's my own. Well, at least we know why. It was nice to hear uh, Elon talk to Ryan about that on, on yeah, the interview. Yeah. Thing. It's like, well, you know, we're not we're not going to change the world selling a couple of thousand roadsters. You know, that's, yeah, it's it's definitely a Halo product. It would have been nice to get a little bit more color on it, though. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. When it gets closer, I'm sure he's going to want to hype it up. Until then, oh, I, I think oh, he wants yeah. To well, Tesla t- tends to be like that. They don't talk about something until they're ready to do something. And uh, but it would just, uh, anyways, just for selfish reasons, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Of course, totally understandable. <laughs> All right, yeah. So it's nice to see the different cars on uh, on display. Um, there was somebody that had um, a video that they took um of one of the handlers whatever he got into the roadster and i paid attention to the door you can definitely tell it has a very thick battery pack because that seat's way the heck up off the ground for a sports car that's so low off the ground you see where the seat is that battery pack's got to be oh probably nine to ten inches thick it wouldn't surprise me that they probably did some contouring too it's not I mean, there's it could go one of two ways, right? It could be a flat battery pack, just like the S and the X and the 3, or they could have done some contouring, much like uh, Lucid Air did, where they had, mm-hmm. if you ever looked at their battery, they have a hump in the front and the back. And Anyways, there's different ways of doing it. Who knows? Uh, we'll be able to see that when the time comes. But that steering wheel is still there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that yeah, yoke is. is still there. Yeah. And I think, I'm starting to believe, and I didn't believe it at first, but I'm starting to think now, that come hell or high water, that steering wheel is going to make it to production. They seem to be pretty bent on that. I, I don't know how well it's going to work out in real life. Uh, the handler did say to the person who asked them, how do you like the steering wheel? Says, I think he said something like, um, it does take some getting used to. That's a very diplomatic answer. Yeah, that's a diplomatic answer. <laughs> I would love if there's a way like retroactively uh, in, in, in like an aftermarket to put that in my car. Like... Put that in the dash for the three. <laughs> oh. Someone Lord. does make a cut steering wheel for the Model Three. Yeah, but that no, but that one for the Roadster. Put put that in my three. Like I put it, put I, it in my veins, please. As as weird as that steering wheel looks, it it looks pretty wild though. Mm-hmm. I would love well, to see it to make it to production because it, it, if if that's in the car and I get it, I'm making I'm taking full <laughs> advantage of that. <laughs> Well, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of miles of driving with it, so you'll be totally set. Oh, that's true, yes, because we do intend on uh, on taking road that road trip. trip that we promised. So. The, the only thing is, the only way I can personally see it working is if the steering is one full turn lock to lock. Because think about mm-hmm. it, if anything really more than 90 degrees... Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that, that's about. Well, oh God, it would have to be almost 180. I wish degrees. I had the video to look at. Look you like just, you did. You, know, you don't want to go hand over hand with this thing that you can't. Right. You know, there's there's yeah. no top to the thing, so it, it's going to be very clunky. Now, I, I don't know how he how did turn. He did turn the car around in the parking lot, and I don't know if he had it full lock on the steering wheel, but it looked like it had a fairly wide turning radius. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, the turning, yeah, sure, because most supercars don't have very practical turning radiuses, but you'd have to have some very funky geometry in the steering rack. I mean, everything is possible. You could have like a variable ratio rack that allows you to do that. So it's very slow, you know, at top, because if the car is capable of 215 miles an hour, you really don't want to be making any sudden moves. Right. The steering wheel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you well, want it pretty dead on center. Yeah. Is it possible, Ian, that some of that could be software controlled? Yeah, sure. You, you you can do all kinds of magic with electric steering now. You know, yeah. vary the rate, vary the uh, the assist, all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. I think the technology is there to do it, so that it's basically in in a parking situation you could have it steer very um, quickly, and at high speed it would be very very slow. So it's it's possible. We'll see if they do. Well, it'll be interesting to find out. But uh, that's a, a, a discussion for another day. I think we've talked about the roadster enough for tonight. <laughs> Consider we don't have any information. That's your about. fault, buddy. You uh, I know, I know. Yeah, and that's, that's all on you. How many, think, how many free ones are you getting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving along. Let's talk about Gigafactory 3. Well, uh, 
we know from all the multiple drone videos we seem to get every other day. Uh, Gigafactory 3, the shell is largely finished on the outside. Um, Elon did confirm that they are starting to outfit the interior as far as what production machinery, mm, don't know yet. I, I think he mentioned something about presses. So some of that stuff is starting to um, to go into place. I did see uh, one of the drone shots from a few weeks ago before they started putting the, the full roof on in one place. Um, you could see there was a pit dug, and that's where they're going to put the uh, uh, the uh, the press the body panel presses. Mm. So, um, anyways, it's moving along, and uh, if you know, all things go well, they said that uh, you know the production is supposed to start towards the end of 2019. Uh, first phase of the factory is slated to be able to produce somewhere in the vicinity of 150,000 Model 3s. Uh, I think Elon did say that they think they might be able to get it eventually through several phases of expansion up to half a million cars. Um, any thoughts on this? I mean, it's looking pretty slick. Yeah. <laughs> they, they build fast over there. They don't fool around. I've never seen mm -hmm. a fa I mean, Elon admitted he's, he's never seen anything built this fast before. I think it might even set a record, isn't it? Oh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. I mean, every time I've gone over there, I've been astonished at this the si scope, speed, and volume at which they build stuff. I mean, the last time I drove from the airport to downtown Shanghai, I think I stopped counting after two hundred major cranes like putting together skyscrapers, like two hundred of them. This is in the span of like less than an hour drive. It's just uh -huh. mind-boggling mm -hmm. the expansion in that place and, and the speed they move at. So, well, it's go. coming along. Yeah. I'll be looking forward to seeing that because uh, that'll certainly reduce some of the tariffs and uh, the import fees and stuff. Because mm -hmm. I think, what did he say? Anywhere from 15 to 40 percent they have to spend, um, or they have to jack up the prices of the cars and stuff. So, that's pretty significant. So, yeah. Um, they also mentioned that they are still on the lookout for uh, Gigafactory Europe. They put up this uh, placeholder image. Uh, of course, there's going to be a lot of people trying to sleuth where this is. That was uh, very they, funny where they had that little picture, <laughs> like a little meadow somewhere in Europe. And then was it was I, JB were, said, okay, that's it. Everybody's going on Google now to try and... They, they were very it. adamant that this is not the not actual location. Right. So, uh, you know, if they're not lying to us, and they're not one to lie to us, don't waste your time. But The, uh, the slide should have said, not a Gigafactory. Not, not a Gigafactory. <laughs> so uh yeah i think um we'll we'll find out more about gigafactory europe situation uh later on this year as far as uh, a final selection it wouldn't surprise me that they would stick this somewhere in germany i think there might be some stuff going on as far as that's concerned um uh, much to the chagrin of probably some of the local manufacturers but hey I think the more the merrier right well the, yeah. the one the one overriding theme with all of this is for both the Asian market and the European market, uh, especially as it works even to the uh, uh, the Pan Pacific Islands too, is that you're you're able to lower the cost for because uh, there's no import duties, you don't have uh, production costs involved in sh shipping it overseas. So you might see uh, once those uh, factories are in full production, when those markets that are closer to those factories start getting cars, all of a sudden. Prices drop, um, and that's and that's a good thing. We're we're seeing it here in the U.S. I mean, you guys in Canada, we have to ship cars to Canada, so obviously you guys pay. Yeah, we have uh, to ship lot. cars to you guys too, you know. Yeah, no, I know. Um, so, <laughs> Lots but, of cars but, are built here and sold. But even states. even with, the, I mean, look from a from a geopolitical conversation with the the trade issues that we're having between yeah. the North American countries, uh, Mexico, Canada, and the United States. You know, there's there's some conversations happening for people who are uh, our elected officials are sort of dealing with that and and the aftermath basically comes down to us, the taxpayers. Um, by and large, though, when you don't have to uh, deal with import taxes and duty fees and stuff like that, then you're able to uh, have less expensive products. So um, I, I think just long term, this is a good thing for those folks in the world who are in the uh, other hemisphere. And uh, yeah, this is this is a, it's, it's good that they're coming online as fast as they are. Uh, cause again, that's, especially with model Y and everything else that's, that's scheduled in production, this is going to be a, a big thing for, uh, furthering their mission at a, at a more, uh, escalated rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're certainly moving along. Um, the other point that they touched upon was, uh, Tesla energy, which appears to be the little bit of a, uh, <laughs> neglected child of Tesla well, uh, over still the last few act. years. What are they supposed to do? The poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a little neglected. Um, they claim that they want to um, double their size from 2018. 
Uh, twice the storage growth compared to 2018. One gigawatt, hour, uh, one gigawatt hour of energy storage deployed in 2018, and the solar roof is currently being installed in about eight different states, which is not enough. There's a big backlog of people who want this product. Oh, yeah. Um, I really wish that Tesla would have spent some more time. I mean, there's still reports coming out of the uh, Gigafactory 2 um, factory in Buffalo. That's what they call mm-hmm. it, where supposedly some of these products are made. Actually, my understanding is that they've uh, they've shifted production of the uh, the supercharger enclosures are actually being made <clears throat> over there now, too. So maybe in an effort to employ some more people and stuff. But, yeah, I find it sad to see that Tesla Energy, after the acquisition of Solar City, has just been, you know, kind of put off to the side. I think they had bigger fish to fry, of course, with the Model 3. But now that things are ramped up and stuff, I'm glad to see that they're, at least on paper, talking about increasing this because, you know, yeah. Uh, I had high hopes for this, and it just kind of, you know, went to the wayside. Well, you know what? I, I think I think there. So there's some validity to what you're suggesting here, uh, which is because the focus for the Model Three ramp up, uh, both locally here in the United States, uh, to our my friends in North, not to your neighbors, but to <laughs> my friends in North and Canada, and of course now overseas. Yes, there was there was a big push to get that going because you wanted to hit certain metrics uh, in every quarter. But at the same time, I can tell you, living here in Florida. AKA the Sunshine State. There has been no shortage of a lot of people wanting to get some energy solutions in their homes, whether it's uh, Powerwall, whether it's uh, um, the solar panels, or now questions abound about the solar roofing. So there, I think it's it's once we start seeing battery production and storage options uh, sort of meet demand, then we'll start seeing those. Uh, but there's a lot of people who who have sort of signed the dotted line here in Florida, and they're just waiting. They're just waiting for the installations, they're waiting for the products, waiting for the batteries, and that stuff to come to them. Um, So it's good that they're trying to focus on now doubling their efforts for this year, uh, in the next six months, really, is what they're trying to do it all. Um, I think it's going to be something that it's going to be very apparent very quickly but, um, like I said, from from what I know, it's, it's not, there's no it's not it's not like it's a non-starter conversation wise a lot of people are waiting for this it's just a matter yeah. of getting the production to meet the demand it's not going to be cheap either i think the number being floated yeah. around for most of these roofs with the solar tiles not solar mm-hmm. panels but the actual glass tiles is 24 dollars us per square foot mm-hmm. uh, that's before you add power walls that's before you right. add any of the inverters and stuff so it's not going to be cheap i mean on a roof like mine by the time i do conversion that's probably around forty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars <laughs> Uh, before you add the power walls. And if you want enough power walls to charge your car, you're looking at minimum two, maybe three of those things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, just, it's not going well, to be What I cheap. think would be great is if state, uh, especially local governments that do this, but um, usually you can do this from your state government, is if they implement some kind of an incentive programming uh, where if you are a homeowner and you're interested in doing this, there's financing options, there's... Uh, uh, reimbursement programming. There's some kind of a stipend that they can use. So that way there's buybacks. So you can have this stuff added to your home, increase the home's value, especially if you're in a state like Florida, where uh, if these tiles, which is shown in early test results, are good for um, storm conditions, hurricanes, stuff like that. Uh, if they're able to improve the value of your home, then why not have it? And then the state of Florida says, okay, we're going to give you a credit on your taxes uh, for doing that. So that there's probably ways of offsetting the cost a little bit and then spreading out the payments uh, like you would your mortgage. Uh, and that would be something I think for some people might be more palatable uh, than just blankly saying, how much is that? Oh, 40000 All right, <laughs> here's a check. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah, we had some really great incentives, but alas, since the uh, election of last year, they are no more. And there's nothing at the federal level. No. There's only, yeah, there's, there's only, uh, well, there's incentives on EV purchases at the federal level, but there's yeah. nothing for solar panels, unfortunately. We were hoping that we have something like that in the budget, but it never And, that, and that can change. That You know, yeah. we, we talked in the show when it came to our climate change conversation. You, the populace, can always write to your officials, and if there's a enough demand from the population then maybe they you know sort of get their act together and they start at least drafting ideas of what they could do to change that policy yeah it can happen you never know it's true okay um elon did talk a little bit <clears throat> and some of this um well, actually let's just talk uh, very briefly of course uh, they did mention that the semi truck is still hoping to start uh production towards the end of 2020 again not really any color as far as where they're going to build it, what the market is really like. It just seems to be Model Y is the main priority for them. Everything else is secondary. So uh, 
uh, you know, semi truck, we're not talking 500,000 cars a year, right? We're talking maybe, meh, 10 to 20,000, maybe to start. I don't know the actual numbers. Um, fairly low, low, um, low volume with that. I mean, they have a pretty good backlog with these vehicles and stuff. And there's nothing to say that they can't build these mm-hmm. in a separate facility and get them off on the road and stuff like that. But it, again, it's still pretty much a low priority. It kind of ranks up there. I mean, I, I think it's secondary to the Model Y and the Roadster is just kind of like a distant third. Uh, which kind of brings us into the cyberpunk truck, of course, because Elon started talking yeah. about the cyberpunk truck again. Um, that is definitely something I think that's very much on the front burner. Once this Model Y is just kind of off the slate, um, uh, we're going to see this thing. Now, he did mention again that they're really hoping to be able to show this thing off late summer of this year. And, of course, the Twitterverse has started going crazy again with all kinds of weird concepts as to what this thing's going to look like. Um, yeah. Uh, the one thing that I know other than death, death and taxes is Franz will deliver the goods. Everybody else is a Photoshop hack. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you see any of these concepts out there, as wild as they may be, I think um, um, reality is a little, a little more subdued. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm sure it will have some very interesting features. Uh, again, we talked about this last time. Of course, we know that the starting price is hoping to come in under $49,000 for a base model. Tesla being Tesla, they never sell the base model first. Always more expensive. Um, he did say, you know, it's not going to look like any other truck. We kind of knew that. And uh, yeah, this thing is going to be, it, it's going to turn some heads. Mm-hmm. Um, two, two things on that. One of them was, I thought it very telling that he gave a much more rational number for towing capacity. Because remember in the initial yeah. exchange of information and tweets and so on last year, it's like, okay. He did say 300,000. Yeah, yeah, which was, absurd but we all know even a model x can tow you know a fairly a wide body airliner so it's it's within the realm of the possible but in terms of passing the actual towing test you know that they use to certify trucks it sounds like a bit of a stretch well um, now, i think, now, I think, now, I think now, it'll be comp- like he did say it was going to be competitive with the f-150 yeah. well, so, which is the know, target market right so now you're you're talking in, in somewhere in the teens right you know 10 12 000 pounds or something of that nature you know maybe a little higher depends on configuration that stuff changes every week but uh yeah that's a much more believable number um i wouldn't be surprised if he exceeds it but i thought wow okay that's an order of magnitude more reasonable than what we were talking about last year <laughs> in terms of the design um just this week I saw a couple of sketches go round. Now, now since he's confirmed that the 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 image that we saw for a fraction of a second at the Y reveal is the front end, which I couldn't believe, it didn't make any sense to me because it looked so square mm-hmm. that you know you're just looking at it at an odd angle. And I don't, you guys maybe have seen some of the images. Maybe Trev, you can find them later. Yep. And throw yeah, I've got. I'll, I'll I'll put them in post. So what they have is this very wedge-like front end. So you've got sort of like a squarish, you know, or some sort of a line that corresponds with that little. That little line, glowing line that we saw in the uh, in the reveal image there, that was just teased at the uh, at the Y reveal, and then you just sort of have this continuous sloping front end. It would be, I guess, all glass or some sort of a mix of of metal and glass going up. So it looks more like the nose of an airliner or something almost. A, a completely different cab shape than we're used to. Um, those those ideas sort of fall more, I think, closer to what we're going to see. That's kind of what I've envisaged because a very tall cab, like some sort of interpretation of the semi, I'm not seeing that. I don't think you'd get the efficiency of having this very tall cab with like nothing behind it. Whereas that's definitely not shape, you know, going up, you could maybe pull off without having to have a cover over the bed uh, so much. So maybe that's what it's going to be. I don't know. You know what? It would not surprise me if when this thing is, eventually revealed that the front and the cab of the car now he did say now whether they hold to these numbers or not you know elon being elon he did say last year uh when he was soliciting uh suggestions i guess on twitter he did say other than the three hundred thousand dollar three hundred thousand pound towing capacity i mean that's okay if you want to tow an aircraft carrier i guess um that it would have seating for six. So based on these sketches, um, it would not surprise me that the bed of this thing not ends up not being a full-size bed. It might end up being like, um, uh, what's that one Ford one where it has a rather short bed and then it has the cage that you can flip out to make it into a large bed. Anyways, just saying that if this thing is, is going to be a pickup truck, um, I wouldn't put it past the realm of possibility that they may end up shorting... Uh, the length of the bed in favor of 
You mean kind of like what the Honda the Reg line, or you can configure. I mean, American pickups you can configure anywhere, typically between five and a half and eight foot long bed. Those are the standards. Yeah, so you like a five That's and a half, six and a half, and an eight. So what you're suggesting is it's the shorty bed, the five and a half. I can't imagine that's the only choice because you're really limiting. There's so many people who need the bigger bed to to actually. And, and I agree with you 100% because when he did solicit um, comments or suggestions on Twitter, one of the things I suggested is please make it, make a version available where you have some kind of bed frame or something like that where it could be extended. Like, I mean, there's a whole market out there. People would like to make RVs out of this thing, a landscape trucks, dump trucks, all kinds of stuff. So don't limit yourself to saying, okay, this is the size of the bed we're going to make. This is the size of the frame. Now, if they do a unibody, that's a little tougher to do because it's, you know, uh, but there are ways of getting around that, right? I'm hoping they won't because that market is generally very dismissive of unibody. This has got to be a body. Well, the ridge line, yeah. Well, exactly. It's, it's You can do a fair amount with that, but if you seriously want a haul, you, you need a real frame. Yeah. We should know fairly soon if he holds to his timeline later on this summer and, uh, you know, they uh, they send out invites to this thing. I wonder how they're going to do it this time around because, of course, the referral program has ended and uh, there's no way to get tickets to these things. So maybe they'll do some kind of raffle. I know there's some, probably some stragglers left over that didn't get to go to the last reveal event uh, from the Model Y and stuff. So they would said that they would be deferred to the next event. So maybe those people get a chance. Oh. I don't know. I'd love to go. <laughs> Oh, wouldn't second, we all? Trip, second trip to California this year? Sure, I'll bite. <laughs> Make a vacation out of it, right? Fine Lab has a line of protective coatings that were engineered to protect your Tesla's paint, leather, carpet, plastic, and wheels, effectively blocking all those UV rays and environmental factors before they ever get to ruin your brand new baby. Fine Lab offers a complete line of car care products and ceramic coatings for both the do-it-yourselfer and professional detailers. Did we mention we also have the world's first self-healing coating? Check us out at finelab.com, that's spelled F-E-Y-N-L-A-B, to see the science behind the self-healing. Check out our product catalog and click contact us for a free quote from a certified installer in your area. Fine Lab and Tesla, we were meant for each other. Then the questions began uh, once the, uh, well, the presentation was rather short and stuff. It was kind of interesting because JB did get up on stage and Drew did as well. Um, it looks like Tesla had a little bit of a vegan uprising again. <laughs> um, yes. Some uh, some people got up and asked them again, what, what was the status on it? Of course, you can get the steering wheel um, off menu as all vegan. You have to ask for it. Uh, but he did say that uh, they're hoping to have all vegan interiors by the end of next year. So there's still some cars uh, like the S and X, for example, still come with leather st- uh, wrapped steering wheels. Um, so yeah, look for that. I again, I kind of agree, and this is one thing I talk I talk to people when they see the white seats on the Model X, they go, "Oh, that's really neat leather." And I said, "No, it's not leather. It's synthetic leather, and it doesn't make sense for a car company that's supposed to be ecologically minded to be using leather." Again, we don't raise cattle for leather. It's just a byproduct of that pro- of that process. And again, you have Mercedes, BMW, all the high-end manufacturers now are moving to synthetics. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just makes more sense. It's better. Um, the white seats are holding up extremely well. Yes, you have to clean them. But, I mean, I don't mind doing that. But they seem to be holding up quite well compared to leather. I mean, I've had leather before in my cars. And after a year and a half to two years, it, it's it's... And I took very good care, you know, with the leather products and stuff. And they would still crack. And they look like hell after a while. So... Um, having used these seats now for a year and a half compared to leather, I'll take these seats any day of the week. Mm-hmm. So really looking forward to uh, to more of that uh, process. Um, yeah. Then the next... <laughs> now, I, I can't play you the clip right now. I highly encourage you guys to watch the video clip, especially when JB comes up and Drew uh, get up on stage because... They start talking, um, one of the questions from the audience is, what are their future plans as far as Maxwell's concerned and, you know, Tesla making cells and stuff? How are you going to grow uh, given that you're battery constrained? And you could tell by watching with the banter uh, that there's something going on, as there always is, and but they weren't ready to let the cat out of the bag. But the way they comported themselves and the looks that they exchanged um, I'm saying basically Elon has basically confirmed that they will end up making their own cells. They did say that um, they they literally said, we've learned a lot from our partners. Well, who's their partner? Well, it's Panasonic, right? Mm-hmm. So they're watching Panasonic, how they do this stuff. Uh, and if you watch the, J- the interaction with JP and Drew on stage, you'll understand. Like they're shooting themselves some glances, some big smiles. 
Um, the Maxwell technology is certainly crucial along with that, with the possibility of bringing, of uh, even getting into mining for strategic, with, with some strategic companies in order to secure the materials that they need. So again, it's, it's one of these things where Tesla, it's not good enough to just say, okay, we'll do this, this. They're really looking far down the supply chain. Um, as they did with the Model 3. It's one of the reasons they designed the cell from the ground up and the chemistry and everything around that car for economies of scale and cost reduction. So they're looking further down the track. Again, the the, the dry electrode technology is something that's coming out of Maxwell. They again talked about, uh, as they did for the autonomy day, that they're going to be having another battery. Uh, well, they'll have another investor day. This one will be focused on battery and powertrain. So there's definitely some developments that are coming down the pike as far as that's concerned. So um, I want I want to get your thoughts on on the inter interaction. If you watch it, you could you could really tell that they're like, oh man, I wish we could say, <laughs> yeah, I wish we could say something. They are I, I, the look on their face, their expressions, yeah. and I think there was a screenshot of them kind of looking at each other. Yeah, um, yeah like they know that. they know something. Oh, they, um, yeah, they know it. The fact that they're scheduling a battery and powertrain investor day for later this year. That alone gives you all the information you need to know that this is going to be a huge, huge reveal event when they get down to it, uh, which could uh, be a precursor to the 400 mile plus range uh, Model S. Uh, it could be a number of different things production wise down the road uh, as their gigafactories expand and supercharging stations and all sorts of stuff. So it, it, it is a really, really big piece of what the future of the company is going to be like. Now, that's the first part. The second thing, is there was a lot of enthusiasm amongst themselves about what this potential really means for the company um, and as it expands to other markets. So what I mean by that, say you are a startup company or you are you have an idea about producing a product. If you are able to look at Tesla and their battery production, which right now Gigafactory 1 um, is at about 80% of their capacity and they're producing about half the batteries in the world, which is crazy. It's just a crazy statistic to throw out there. Well, if you if all of a sudden now they're able to do more of their stuff in house and they're producing a denser, more efficient fuel cell or whatever, then your company goes, you know what? We want to buy your batteries. We want to buy your technology. And they're going to go, okay, well, sure. So it is to the idea that they could go far beyond just Tesla branded products that they can actually outsource it and sell it to other companies, I think is also. Uh, a possibility so we'll see if that's something that's going to be planned on the road but um if they're able to be one of the largest uh makers of batteries in the world why would other companies not look at the tesla and say hey we need your help because we want to produce this product we need your batteries to do that yeah there's room for expansion um mm -hmm. as far as supply chain stuff is concerned and, and branching out but right now it's you know it's all hands on deck to get as many cars i think once tesla has I don't know, maybe five or six models under their belt, then they'll be in a good financial position to be able to, you know, spread their wings, so to speak, and maybe just do some other stuff. But right now, um, you know, they don't have enough products really to, uh, I, to I, be too distracted. I figured out the whole secret behind this whole oh, yeah? thing. What is Boring it? Company is actually, a, it's a front. <laughs> I see mining machines. The Boring Company is actually a front for the mining company. The mining company? Yes. That's going to be the next the mining. mining company, yes. These are actually high-speed mining machines they're developing. Don't tell anyone. All right. Tinfoil hat off. Continue. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I don't have much more to say because that's most of the salient information that was uh, come out of the... Uh, uh, the shareholder meeting, unless oh. you guys have anything else. Oh, I yes, do. Eric. I do. Oh, oh. this is great. Okay, okay. Well, please. All right. So pre preceding the conversation on the semi and the pickup, I thought this was huge. The new mobile service fans. Ooh. Ooh. So there was news came out this week where not only they're new mobile service fans, they're now retrofitting some model X's because they can actually do some bigger projects. Some bigger, that's not the first time I've heard that. He did say one time when they were going to do that, they were going to outfit some Model Xs, but I, I've right. never seen any yet. So um, so this was something that was uh, talked about during their presentation. So if your car breaks down, it will automatically send a notice to mobile Tesla service to immediately be dispatched to go fix your car. Uh, they did a trial experiment for this in the Bay Area. It's now right. uh, it's been expanded to L.A. Uh, for tire repairs. 
for example. Oh, so nice. you don't have to call. They'll just all of a sudden just do it. Uh, the other thing they're doing now is uh, they're going to be adding bumper and minor collision repairs as features of these service vans. Uh, Tesla just did his first bumper repair from a mobile service van, and Elon had said that that kind of repair usually would take about weeks or months. But in this uh, experiment that they did, it took less than an hour. I'm so jealous, man. I, they just took my car for a week through the bumper. Where the hell were they with this idea a month right? ago? Right. Uh, yeah. So, so imagine if it's just like a minor thing, or par- someone hits you in a parking lot, or whatever it is. Like you know, you call Tesla, and they're in and out within. It'd be like they're able to do repairs now for things that it's almost like re- like when Safe Light repairs a, a window, yeah. yeah, on your car. Exactly. Like you can basically like go do the soccer thing with the kids. You come back and like, oh, my car's fixed. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about that? Know, it's, that's awesome. Yeah. No, I'm glad to see that they're putting so many resources into mobile service because, mm-hmm. I mean, if you've ever experienced it, it, it truly is awesome. It's game changing. Yeah. I, I hate taking my car to to the Tesla depot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'd rather for most things that they come and fix it. Now, I have experienced it before and it's, and, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty game changing. So, yeah, they need to put so. Now, keep, keep put more effort into that. I was going to say, regarding that, uh, Tesla released a statement today uh, to uh, Electric. I know. I know. Uh, but they said, Tesla is expanding service headcount substantially in literally every country in which we operate. As we've said, service is a top priority for Tesla, and we're making many improvements as we expand our mobile service offering and streamline the experience for customers. Part of this effort includes reviewing our business to ensure we're operating as efficiently as possible and restructuring some roles or moving employees to new positions that better support the service organization. We will continue to hire more service technicians and grow this area of the business. So they are, there is some restructuring and shuffling around uh, when it comes to service. But the good thing is they're going to have um, a, a, some service updates through the mobile app later this year. Uh, we're obviously seeing now more options for their mobile fleet when it comes to repairs. So we may find more technicians are actually away from the service center and in cars on the road uh, being available to help uh, all the various owners as more and more cars come into production. So that's a good thing. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, it looks like he's following through on his promise where uh, service is going to get some more love and attention. So Yeah. Nice and you were, and you were one of those ardent supporters. Who said, Listen, we love everything. This is one area we think there could be some improvement. And I think we're, we're seeing that. And this might have been something that's been planned for a while. Just now it's becoming uh, publicly known. The other thing I want them to improve is communications. Which they talked about that during during the the the, the broadcast the other day, and uh, again today during the E uh, three event. Yeah, communications needs some that needs some love for sure. He knows that. Well, he, he look Tesla and Elon talked about this during the presentation uh, the other day, which is their greatest uh, avenue for getting that taken care of is really through us, the owners. It is as long as we keep talking about Tesla, we keep talking about it with people. Um, I know our friend Raphael is always sharing stories about conversations he's having with with strangers about uh, his vehicle and other Tesla cars. So that's a good thing. You need you just need to keep kind of hounding those folks who just are inquisitive. I had a coworker today leaving my office. My car is parked right out the front, and uh, he sees my Model Three and he goes, "That's my car." And I <laughs> and I and I, just, <laughs> I open the door and go, "No, it's my car." Um, but I said, "But if you guys have questions, you ever want to take it for a spin, you just let me know." So, and that's the idea. Just, just that's people, the way to do are, it. people are inquisitive. They want to know. Uh, and we've seen story after story after story of a Tesla owner saying, I, I just got in the car. My neighbor let me drive it. I went down to the studio, whatever it was. And all of a sudden, you get behind the wheel and you're like, it's a transformative experience. And quick shout out. Uh, I ha- we have a, a, a show listener. Donald, if you are listening to the show down in Australia, congratulations. He's now a new owner of a Model 3. He was waiting, I think, six years to get a Tesla. So we finally pulled the trigger. Uh, Use my referral code was kind enough to do that. Oh, very nice. That was a great thing. So, Donald, if you're listening, thank you so much. And congratulations. We're happy that you're part of the family now. Hey, congratulations, Donald. Yeah. Yes, the more the merrier, right? (laughs) That's right. (laughs) That's great. Yeah, I know we love to hear from people from all over the world that... uh, you know, the, I mean, not a day goes by when somebody, you know, tags me on Twitter or whatever. Hey, finally got my Model 3. It's like, ah, uh, I love it. I love Wait till it. all the Model Y start getting delivered. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no my idea. goodness. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we, we, I mean, every day we're hearing numbers of Model 3 owners as they, the sales keep going. If, if we are looking at two, two and a half times the demand for Model Y, holy crap. 
That's all I can tell you. Yep. It's looking good. Well, uh, I think that covers what we have to talk about for the shareholder meeting. Now, today, um, Elon was a guest uh, with uh, Justin Roiler at the E3 conference. That's the big games um, thing going on. And I heard from uh, Ryan McCaffrey. He didn't get a chance to interview Elon, but he was in the same room. <laughs> and he watched the whole thing. Anyways, um, I'll put a link in the uh, show description. Uh, you guys can check out the video, of course. But th- we got to see something really cool because they actually showed us some live video of two games uh, that have been ported to the Model 3. Again, uh, remember when Elon said that they were porting the Unity and the Unreal game engine over to the Model 3? So they showed Cuphead, and the other game is a driving game, and the name escapes me right now, but I'm going to show you what the video looks like right now. Uh, this is the game Cuphead actually playing on the Model 3 screen. Whoa, right. I went too far. I went too the far. other I game was uh, Beach Buggy Racing what? 2. Yes, yes, thank you. Beach Buggy Racing. And um, the person that's in the car is actually using an Xbox controller. So, yeah, you can actually use it. Uh, where's the Beach Buggy? Let me just fast forward here to the Beach Buggy part. Uh, did I blow past it? I must have blew past right it. Oh, son of a gun. There it is. Beach Buggy. Oh, great. <laughs> I screwed it up. Uh, let's see here. Where'd it go? I thought I had it queued up properly. There we go. Here it is. Oh, and it's a Model 3. It's a little mini Model 3. Oh, is it? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a little mini Model 3. And the, the other cars are Teslas, too. So you're racing a bunch of Teslas in the game. But it says... It looks play. awesome. And the person is using the steering wheel and the brakes and the pedals. Mm-hmm. Anyways, it's a, it's a pretty short little clip. But heck of a lot of fun, and it shows some real promise. Now, as I, I was talking to you guys earlier, there's no way in hell that this game is playing on my Model X, but you guys yeah. with threes, you're really lucky to be able to get this. It looks You really... know, that's right. <laughs> yep, I know, I know. The most expensive video game in history. <laughs> hey, all we know is you had a reservation. You could have gotten your Model 3. You could have saved yourself all the hassle, but no. I, yeah, hey, I, I could gonna... always sell my. Hey, I could always sell my Model X and buy one of the new ones with the new MCU. That's in true. It. Hey, you it know what? You also your Roadster might be able to do a lot more. Uh, well, that's a different animal altogether. I know. But anyways, I know. so it just shows that there, there's definitely some progress uh, happening. Now I said it's not ready for prime time yet because they were having some issues, I guess, with the game. You know, maybe the brakes and stuff. Uh, who knows what happened with what's going on with that? But. Um, it really shows that they're making some fast progress with mm-hmm. this. Um, what was he, what was the other thing he was saying? Something about the games, and I forget what it was. Ah, uh, it escapes me right now. But anyways, I'll put the link down in the show, and you. You know what my biggest it. takeaway from this event was today? What was that? Um, and and this is a profound thing to think about again because we love thought experiments on the show. Uh, somebody had asked him, "What is the biggest failure that you've gone through?" And his and Elon says, "I blew up three rockets in the beginning. That was bad." Uh, had the fourth rocket not launched, we wouldn't have SpaceX and we wouldn't have Tesla. That's true. That That's I mine. just all that idea, mine. like when when we think of all the detractors, and we had this conversation before we started mm. recording. When you think about the number of detractors who are seeing the progress of both of these companies and the successes that they've had, and every SpaceX launch is a must-see event uh, because of just you're waiting to see if the stage one. Uh, rocket comes back to Earth. You're looking to see if the fairing deploys correctly. You're looking, to, you know, all the different uh, successes they've had. Um, the amount of failures that happened from the very beginning, and we know rocket science is not easy. It is very complicated. Nope. We've, we've seen in the early stages of Apollo, celebrating its 50th year this year. Thank you, history. Um, we knew we knew of all the histories uh, that Apollo program went through, where they just had failure after failure after failure until they finally got the rocket right. Tesla and, and, I'm sorry, SpaceX didn't have that same luxury. So for them to have basically said, if the fourth one didn't go off, neither of these companies would be in existence, it's a profound thing to think about. Um, and it goes to show how the margin of error in this day and age is extremely, extremely minuscule. Um, that, you know, we wouldn't be able where we are if it had been for the uh, success of the fourth launch. Yeah, well, some good points in there. Mm-hmm. Oh, speaking of which, just in mm-hmm. case, oh, you guys probably can't see it. Oh, son of a gun. Yeah, it's not working. Language. Uh, son of a gun, it's not working. Um, my my Apollo lander is right there on display, but I don't have it on the big screen to show you right now. That's totally fine. Uh, we'll show I it can, next time. 
Fun can... build. Highly recommend it if you like the space stuff like I do. How long did it take compared to the Bugatti? Oh, gosh, the Bugatti. Uh, well, <laughs> the Bugatti is like 3,600 pieces. This thing's just coming in over 1,000. So, oh, maybe maybe three or four hours to build. It's a pretty quick build. Okay, not bad. It's pretty fun. Anyways, it's not about a Lego show, but I'll, I'll <laughs> gladly do, I'll do Lego videos. Any, if any want chance it, right to talk about your Legos, you're like, ooh -hoo. Hey, I have lots of them up here, too. Anyways, yeah. that's a show for another day. All right, so that's what uh, what happened today at E3. Um, of course, the uh, people at um, the... Uh, for those of you who follow what's going on in the UK, the fully charged uh, live show just ended. Yay. And... Um, they used a bunch of uh, UK owners, uh, Tesla UK owners offered to... Uh, Tesla Owners UK. Tesla Owners UK, yes. Thank you very much. They were uh, doing a shuttle service. So it's nice to see that those guys are participating again. I, we need Here. more of that stuff. So. Yeah, that, that was pretty amazing. Something like, uh, I think, 90 different owners participated, if I got yeah. my numbers correct. Mm -hmm. And I forget the stats, but I mean, it was like thousands and thousands of people they moved uh, over the uh, course of the weekend. Yeah. And... One of, the, one of the things that struck me, and a uh, big shout out to Paul R. on Twitter, who brought this to my attention, mm -hmm. is that uh, Tesla Owners UK has been very active in um, donating the radio flyer, uh, Baby yes. Tesla, yep. to uh, children's hospitals all over the UK. Uh, I think it started when, you know, the owners started winning them as part of the referral program and they were just donating them straight to the hospitals. And it was it went over so well that they reached out to Tesla and uh, Elon did two things, which I think was remarkable, is they did a one for one for every um, radio flyer car that they bought or or donated. He, he was matching it. So one for one nice. every time. Tesla Owners UK donated a car. He would donate a second one. And he also hooked them up directly with Radio Flyer to get a discount on additional cars when they were buying them. So they since had uh, ongoing fundraising events to um, to buy more of the cars and get, I mean, 100% of the funds that you donate go to buying these cars. And then Tesla Owners UK, at, on their own spare time, out of their own free will, do take care of all the logistics, get the cars in. They actually ceramic coat them before they give them the Are you kidding? Oh, yeah, they do. Of that yeah yeah they do just you know to protect them so they make sure that they 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 stay nice and clean whatever and they deliver them to to all these children hospitals so that was part of this is uh you know as as part of the shuttle service you were invited if you know if you so wanted to 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 donate to it and they've raised i think over eight thousand pounds just in the last little while that's awesome so maybe we could put a a link in i'll i'll send you the link for it trev if we can at the end of the show where you can go and you can still donate and you know help help these kids get into uh, a little model i mean having just just given one to uh, to my granddaughter. I mean, and seen her face light up. She's only a year old, and she freaked over this thing. She was <laughs> crawling all over it. Just absolutely loved it. To to think of some poor kid stuck in a hospital with nothing better to do. Oh my God, that must be life changing to have something like that to bomb around in. So those, I, those are, little cars are awesome. They really yeah. are, aren't they? In, the, in their tweet, they sent out uh, on June tenth, in the wee hours in the morning on June tenth for us. Uh, they said that we moved about eighty percent of all guests in and out of the fully charged show at Silverstone UK over the past three days while raising awareness of our joint charity partnership with the Christian Blandford Fund, where we buy exactly. toy Tesla radio flyer cars and deliver them to children, uh, hospitals, and hospices so those needing their services can have some respite from the terrifying reality of often the toughest fights of their lives. It's our complete honor to do this, and we would like to thank every single person that attended the event and put some cash in their buckets or tapped our donation card machine. The charity has zero pounds in overhead for this campaign. We get them discounted from the supplier. We deliver the cars ourselves. We build them. We ceramic coat them. And nobody claims expenses, salaries, etc. Uh, if you do want to help donate to that charity, uh, Ian mentioned that there will be a link later in the description for this uh, podcast. You can go to Tesla Owners Group. That's a plural. Tesla Owners Group. <laughs> co. Uk. Uh, there'll be a link on the site for the uh, donate money. Uh, page you can go to uh, and you can contribute some money for them and again support this incredibly uh heartwarming lovely cause uh that mm. gives back to the uh, the kids in, in those uh, in those hospitals that's awesome yeah oh i do want to give a, a shout out to our good friend ken bacor he attended the fully charged uh, live show again for the second time nice uh, so he will have a report on the uh, ev revolution show i'm Sure, pretty, pretty, pretty soon. So, um, if you subscribe to his YouTube channel, you'll be able to see his report on that. So, all right. Um, 
the last thing we we're going to talk about tonight was a tweet um, from uh, our good friend Rafael Teslatino, of course. Um, he tweeted on July, on June 9th, I should say, mm-hmm. uh, Model 3 maintenance for one year, one windshield washer fluid, two tire rotation maintenance budget for one year is $3 if you rotate the tires at home. Uh, to which Elon tweeted back at him. Of course, he probably set his phone on fire. <laughs> Annual tire rotation is actually <laughs> optional, only worthwhile if you see significant differential wear on the inside versus outside of the tire. Now, having said that, Ian, uh, you wanted to talk about tire rotation to the masses. So I'm going to let you take the soapbox. I can't believe I'm about to say this. I'm going to be at crucified. I shouldn't, <laughs> I, shouldn't, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say it aloud, but guess what, folks? Elon's wrong. Oh my God! No! No! No, Ian! No! Take, take it back! Take it back! Take it back! Take it back! No! 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 I'm so no. done. My, my car is never going to get serviced again. I'm excommunicated, right? No. Uh, okay, he's not a hundred percent wrong, but uh, I would take issue all, specifically because, yeah. You you can. I mean, from everything I've observed on Model 3, it actually wears tires fairly evenly, inner to outer. It doesn't do anything strange. I mean, having had a, whole, a lot of different European cars with, you know, the, they have these sometimes very super negative uh, camber alignments, you know, where the wheels are canted very inwards towards the top. And it tends to eat the inside of the tires. And, you know, you get all kinds of funny patterns. You know, those, little, those rice rockets running around with the tubbed out tires and the camber well, all it, screwed up. The Stance Nation crowd, where it's kind of like, if your wheel isn't at a 45 degree angle, you're doing That's it wrong. Ridiculous. Oh, yeah, that like gives tire engineers nightmares, that stuff. That we're not talking about that. But no, the, the cars so far seem to be pretty reasonable. But they do one thing, which is very obvious, and they wear the rear tires at about twice the rate of the front. Um, particularly if you have uh, a rear wheel drive one and that, that's because there you go. Like, like Mr. Camacho, the reason this is happening and it happens on any EV. I mean, even our volt and, you know, a leaf will do this because the power delivery, the torque delivery on, on an EV drivetrain is so instantaneous. Even if you're, you know, Casper milk toast type driver, the minute you put your foot down, boom, this thing is transferring torque to the wheels and it's, it's chewing up the little tread blocks. Mm-hmm. So, and if you drive like me, well, you're really making things worse for yourself. So you're, you're going to chew up your rear tires a lot quicker than the front. Even my performance dual motor car uses the rears close to twice the rate of the front because mm-hmm. most of the power, even on a dual motor car, is at the back. So if you're enjoying the car as you should, and I encourage you to, you're going to go through more rear tires than you are front. Now, if you follow Elon's advice and you don't bother rotating them, um, all you have to do is replace the rear tires. But now you're going to be always in a situation where you've got half used front ones and brand new rears or, you know, almost bald rears with half used fronts. I'm not a big fan of that. I always like to see tread depth relatively similar front to back. Um, so there's two reasons I recommend you do your rotations. Number one, try and keep your tread depths even this way when you're in wet conditions or whatever, the car's traction limits are going to be essentially the same front and rear. So you're not going to have the front slide out or the rear slide out unexpectedly. Of course, the traction control system will try and mitigate that for you, but it can only do so much. It's not magic. So you you always want both ends of the car to have relatively similar traction. It's, it's safer that way. And the other thing, too, is it tends to keep the tires quieter. And the reason that happens is because the forces applied to the tire in front and back are quite different. Even in a car which is super perfectly aligned, what you're going to find happening is when you step on the brakes, about 70 to 80 percent of the braking force is happening on the front tires. Think of your tire treads as like little bristles on a brush. And they're going to tend to when you force them to break, what's happening is they're being squeezed in one direction towards the back of the car as it sort of lurches over onto the front tires. And when you accelerate, Again, 60 to 70% of the force or 100% of the force in the case of a a rear-wheel drive Model 3 is going to go to the back and the tire blocks are going to be stressed in the opposite direction. So over time, if they're only being forced in one direction or the other, you're going to get this kind of slightly uneven wear in in the tread blocks themselves. So to keep them running really quietly, you you want them sort of back and forth, back and forth, you know, every 8,000 miles or so, you know, I do it more often because I change tires twice a week because I'm a complete idiot and I have way too many sets of tires, <laughs> but a normal sane person. Yeah. You know, at a minimum when you're changing in, if you live in an area where you've got winter tires, it's easy, just back and forth over the seasons, make sure you, you, you move them back and forth. And if you're fortunate to live in one of the beautiful Southern States where you can get away with one tire all year round, like Mr. Camacho, you know, every 8,000 miles, get the car up in the air and uh, get them changed. I mean, a lot of places will charge you a very small sum just to have you 
come into the bay and have a look at the car. And, you know, if you're so inclined to spend 200 bucks on a nice high performance hydraulic jack, get yourself some little, uh, the hockey puck adapters and some tools and do it yourself. So there you go. Never an episode goes by without me learning something about wheels and tires. Yeah. Yeah. I got yeah. the best guy on the show. <laughs> I, mean, I could have done that in 30 seconds, but but so no. We've we've talked in the past about like the road conditions here in Florida because we we have uh basically shell fragments intermixed with the asphalt uh to counter the extreme heat that comes off the roadways here. Um I would venture to guess that that does necessitate the need to rotate the tires. I might mean, just have my tire rotation, albeit a bit later than I would like to have in terms of the mileage on it. Uh, I didn't, I don't see the tread depth so far affected by done, doing it around because I'm approaching, I think tomorrow morning when I drive to work about two, three miles in, I'll hit 20,000 miles on my car. Oh, nice. Um, so milestone, but uh, <laughs> milestone. But the, um, the, the rotation was done, I think around 18, some odd thousand miles. And uh, granted, I, I, I paid a pretty good price for it, but at least I feel like the roads here I have to, because if I didn't do it, uh, those, you know, those shell fragments just little by little just chip away at that rubber. And I would sort of experience what you're mentioning, which is I'd have uh, greater tread wear on the rear wheels than I would in the front, since I have a rear wheel drive car. Would you, would you say that's, that's fairly reasonable? Yeah, the, the abrasive qualities of the road surface are definitely going to have an effect. We see that in areas that have concrete roads over asphalt. I think it tends to increase wear slightly. Um, the stuff you guys are using in Florida might be a little worse for that. But mm-hmm. oddly enough, um, just rolling along at a steady speed on those surfaces, the effect on all the different types of surfaces you're going to roll on have pretty much the same effect front and rear because what's happening is if you're rolling at a a steady 65 miles an hour, Mm -hmm. maybe you in Florida will use your tires up slightly more quickly than somebody in another state that's running on pure asphalt. Mm -hmm. But what what really affects, the reason you want to rotate them is because of the forces applied are different. And regardless of the surface you're running on, that inequality of forces front to rear is what causes them to wear at different rates and wear differently because of the type of work that they're doing. Mm. So, yes, what you're talking about would overall affect the speed at which you'd have to replace your tires. It might not last as long. Yeah. But um, the need to rotate them is the same no matter where you are because of the reasons I described uh, earlier. Would you Would you also advise people that it's not just a matter of taking, like, switching, like, driver front, driver rear. You want to do a cross pattern so that the, let's say, the driver front wheel ends up being the passenger rear like, you know, do like a cross pattern when you do a rotation or just simply switching them for our cars specifically, just doing a switch from the set in the rear goes to the front and the ones in the front go to the rear. Would that be is sufficient for our cars? Do you think a, a cross pattern is better? Um, what say you, oh, wise man? <laughs> I'm a fan of going front to rear uh, simply for the, the the mechanics of what's going on when I described earlier. If you take the front left which has got, you know, braking forces pushing the tread blocks in a certain direction, and you mm-hmm. now make it the right rear, you've now aligned it in such a way that the accelerative forces from the rear axle are propelling that tread block the same way the brakes were up front on the other side. Mm-hmm. If you can sort of picture in your mind how what's going yeah. on there. Yeah, yeah, I so I, I tend to just go front and back. There's certain cars, for whatever reason, really like having the diagonal mm-hmm. rotation, you know, just because of the way they're set up and they're they're they, it's like that that's their little happy spot. But I found on most of the recent cars I've had, and the three included, from what I've been able to observe in what am I at twenty two thousand kilometers, so around um, fourteen fifteen thousand miles. Um, that's that's kind of like what it seems to be happy with. So front to back on the same side is working for me. But by all means, as long as you have either a unidirectional or an asymmetric tire, you can go side to side. The only people who can't do that is if you're running a unidirectional tread, those little V-groove treads. Mm -hmm. Unless you take them off the rim and reverse them, you can't go side to side. You just have to So speaking of which, I have a question for you. Um, I'm running the 22 turbines on my X, and it's a staggered setup. Well, sir. How do I... Can I, I can't do a tire rotation? Uh, if you have Swap asymmetrics, or... you could go left to right, but I don't think you're going to benefit very much. I mean, uh, it might help a little bit with, you know, the block wear because of what I described earlier, because you're going to change. the best I can do is just swap tires from the same, like the yeah. two backs. Yeah, your axle and your, your axle and front axle, you can go side to side. I mean, depending on what, I can't remember what you, what have you got for 22-inch tires, Trev? Uh, the Pirelli Scorpions. 
Uh, the stock there, ones that came with the with the wheels. Yeah, there's a few variants. Pirelli has all sorts of different patterns, and some of them are asymmetric, and some of them are directional. You'd have to look and see the exact model that you have if it's directional or not. If it's directional, well, no, they 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 live and die where they are. But if they're asymmetric, then uh, asymmetric, asymmetric, tomato, tomato. So you so go an arrow on the sidewall. Uh, well, what'll happen is directionals will have a little arrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, asymmetrics will have inside, outside. So you'll, of course, looking from the outside, unless you, you didn't get them installed correctly, they're always going to say outside. So if it says outside, that means you can go left to right, no problem. Hmm. Tesla put them on the first time. And when I took them off for the winter, I put them in proper bags, labeled correctly, and they went back on the same way. So I honestly, I haven't really looked at them. So other than that one wheel that I destroyed on that curb, but that's a story oh. for another day. I had a fix though. It looks brand new, so. I'm happy. Yeah. Ian, I have I have one last question for you. So you mentioned road conditions, obviously in states like ours, but what effect does uh, winter roads and especially those that have been salted, what mm -hmm. effect does that have on tires and wheels? Well, um, salt isn't going to do anything to rubber. Um, that's not really a big issue at all, but it sure plays hell with certain wheel finishes. Uh, up mm -hmm. here, we we the only wheel we'll sell in winter is a fully painted one because you've got so many different layers. You've got, you know, typically an alloy wheel that's been painted. It's got a primer mm -hmm. layer, got multiple uh, layers of color, then it's got a clear coat on top of it. So even if you chip away at the first few layers, you're not getting it down to the base alloy. Mm -hmm. But uh, some other finishes, particularly what we call a machined finish, that's where you have, you know, that very finely turned yep. sort of gleaming um, exposed, well, it's not exposed aluminum, but it looks like exposed aluminum on mm -hmm. the face of the wheel, often with a colored background, like a black background or a colored mm -hmm. background or something. And then there's a very thin, clear lacquer it's the only thing between the aluminum and the outside world is that very very thin lacquer clear coat over the top of it if that gets chipped well that's it water and salt are getting in and you get what i call winter worms which is those little squiggly white lines of mm -hmm. grayish and then it just starts to peel off your uh, your lacquer. clear coat it yeah. looks hideous it looks like the the wheels developed some disease so that's that's a big no-no likewise chrome plated alloy wheels in winter is generally a no-no mm -hmm. because if there's any porosity in the chrome whatsoever salt oh, will get pitted. in there yeah and it'll start corroding from underneath and bubbling up all the chrome it's no again it looks like it's developed scabies or something <laughs> Well, since, since the cold weather can affect your PSI, does PSI uh, have any effect long-term over how much tread is worn on a tire? Oh, yeah. No, having properly inflated tires is uh, key to making sure they wear. And this is kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You know, there's too much and there's too little and there's just right. So you want to have your tire inflated at whatever is recommended. Although I should note that Tesla in every instance I've seen, is recommending more air pressure than is required to support the car and give you absolute perfect tread wear um, mm -hmm. because obviously they want to go for range. And, yeah. and there's very little harm in overinflating a tire. You, you, there's a slight loss of performance. As I proved when I went autocrossing with the car the other day, you definitely get better straight-up performance out of the car if you lower mm -hmm. the pressure. Uh, and this is why I'm really looking forward to when they finally giving us uh, resettable TPMS where we can program our tire pressures to match with TPMS sensors. But let's not go off on the tangent. But yeah, <laughs> ultimately, you want to keep the tire well inflated. So at least at what somewhere around what Tesla is recommending, a few pounds down for comfort is fine. But okay. you know, in that zone, because if you inf if you if you lower the pressure too much. The, there's a huge risk that you're going to get failure because now the tire can no longer support the weight of the vehicle. It can overheat and explode, which is bad. But assuming it doesn't do that, what will happen is the tire is going to run on its outside shoulders. So the the outer shoulders you'll see start to wear. If you see a car driving around and like the outside part of the treads are gone, right. inside notes, it's running with too little air. Conversely, mm. if you put way too much air in, what will happen is the center of the tire will start to bulge out. And right. now you're just running on the center part and now the, the middle of the tread wears away and you've got perfectly healthy shoulders. So mm -hmm. you know, that's no mm -hmm. good either. You, you want to keep in that happy middle zone. Cool. Learn something new every week. Well, there you go. <laughs> I serve last, my purpose. <laughs> that's okay. Well, last but not least, in case you haven't noticed, uh, 2019.20.1 is in wide release now. It went out in a flood uh, starting yesterday afternoon. So oh, yeah, car true. up to Wi-Fi. Hopefully, Eric, you can find a Wi-Fi spot long enough for your car to grab the uh, the update. Someday, someday. What do you want? <laughs> I told you, man. Stick a, you need a Wi-Fi repeater in that apartment, sticking out in the backyard, and just spread that signal. Like Good luck with butter, that, man. champ. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Uh, yeah, the only my, just is dog mode. There's a dog mode improvement. You know, Earl's um, go with moon, I'm sure, but I don't use that. I did see one other feature on my Model X. I get the chirp now if you want, like when you uh, lock the car, it, it does a double. Which pattern. is amazing. It took that no, long. No, the SNX don't on the have that. Oh my three God. for over a year. Yeah, well, us we don't get any love. The Model X doesn't get any love as far as the <laughs> software is concerned. So, no, I finally got that, so I turned that on. Well, what would you rather have? A, a, a major uh, a computer update, or would you rather have your uh, your bird, your car, your bird, your car chirp? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for Enhanced Summit. There you go. Yeah, Just for the dog and pony show. Not that yeah. I would ever use it, but anyways. Oh, it's still coming. Easy. It's still coming. I want Be version patient. 10. That's all I want. Uh, version 10. Yeah, well, sometime next year, I think. Later next year. Yeah. We'll see. Anyways, that's the end of that, guys. I think we've talked enough. Uh, Eric, since you're on the screen, where can people find you if they want to have a chit-chat with you on the internet? Absolutely. You guys can find me on Twitter at the handle ECFIX. That is E-C-F-I-X. Uh, you can always uh, send me a message, say hello. Uh, don't send me spam because I will promptly block you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you guys can find me on Twitter. Excellent. How about you, Ian? Where can people find you? And what do you uh, want to plug? What do I want to plug? Okay. Uh, find me on Twitter, at Ian Pavelko, on uh, Tesla Owners Online. Mad Hungarian is the handle. And uh, any technical questions, I encourage you to, to use the forum route because we can have a much bigger, much more involved discussion with the whole community. Little quick directed questions on Twitter, I don't mind, but it's kind of like when we get into the questions of what's the best tire? Oh boy, that's a long subject. Mm -hmm. So. Let's get into the forum on that one. Um, of course, I will give a little plug to the um, Evolve Wear line of um, T-shirts that I raise funds for various EV organizations. Tonight, I'm wearing my Weapons of Mass Adoption, mass adoption. Uh, hoodie. Uh, of course, there's the classic Evolve line. That you can find at teespring.com, T-E-E, -E, spring, all one word, dot com. Just look up, uh, once you're on there, um, Google up uh, Mad Hungarian Evolve Wear on the site, and you will you will find my shop with all the various designs. And uh, Mr. Uh, Page, I'm sure you'll be kind enough to just throw a little linky there on the end. Always. You demand. Always. Well, thanks for that, guys. And uh, as usual, if you want to find me, uh, one of the best places is on Twitter. The handle's at Model3Owners. My handle on the forum is Trev P. Uh, check out the forum, of course, at Tesla Owners Online. And if you'd like to uh, support the channel in any which way you can, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the uh, Patreon page. You'll find that at patreon.com forward slash Model3OwnersClub. I know, I know. Enough about that. <laughs> And uh, lastly, I want to say a great big thank you to our sponsors. That's the guys at uh, Doolaban Insurance, Fine Lab Ceramic Coatings, and the great guys at Evanex who make some really great Tesla accessories. And with that, we will bid you adieu and uh, good night for everybody, and we will catch you on the next one. Good night. Bonsoir tout le monde. Bye, Canada. Bye, Canada.